All right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, potentially good morning, very early morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the GDS webinar series. Uh, this is our, I believe, uh, sixth session uh, after the cancellation of March meeting 2020. Uh, my name is Mohammed Sultan Yaha. I am the past chair of uh, GDS, and uh, I was also uh, uh, the chair for the March meeting uh, session. And I uh, here have uh, Jay Ren uh, with me, uh, who is the current chair of uh, GDS, and uh, Alexis Knopp, who would be moderating uh, today's session. So today's session, uh, uh, this is the data science education and uh, we uh, have already delivered three of the talks uh, thanks for all the speakers who have uh, accepted uh, and be, uh, have been very flexible for uh, for this online delivery uh, and we have the remainder two invited uh, speakers uh, for today and i will let in a, in a couple minutes i will let alexis to uh, introduce the speakers. Uh, disclaimers, uh, one of them is uh, myself. And uh, I uh, just a quick note on that. Uh, it I was suggested by a couple of the GDS executive committee members uh, to present here uh, for uh, for this session. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, hopefully not conflict of interest since I was also chairing this session. Um, we had a cancellation and uh, I was more than happy to share uh, some of my uh, work in the classroom all right great so if you have been following us uh in the past webinars uh we have uh actually unfortunately we don't have everyone's name here but we we've had quite a few speakers uh in the past few weeks i presented their work uh, in the webinar series and um i uh, i want to thank all them on behalf of uh, gds for doing this. If you missed any of these talks, all of the talks are available on YouTube. Uh, we do have a channel if you look up GDS APS or if you look up the hashtag GDS virtual, you should be able to uh, uh, find all of these talks uh, there. Um, I would also uh, encourage you to uh, stay connected with us. We are planning to continue these webinars. Uh, our current goal is to finish uh, all of the invited talks and some contributed talks uh, that was scheduled that were scheduled uh, for the uh, March meeting 2020 uh, in a webinar setting uh, weekly. And after that, we are going to continue um, this. It would become a, hopefully a tradition. Uh, we will have monthly webinars. So please find us on uh, social media uh, and stay connected so you get informed by uh, the upcoming uh, about the upcoming uh, events. This information is also copied in the chat box, so you may uh, go ahead and uh, choose any of these platforms that you would like to follow us. All right, with that, I would like to turn it to Alexis to introduce our first speaker, uh, Amir Shah Maradi. Okay, um, Amir Shamarudi is an assistant professor of physics and data science programs at the University of Texas at Arlington and a faculty research associate at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. He received his PhD in physics from the University of Texas at Austin in 2015 and subsequently worked as a Peter O'Donnell postdoctoral fellow at the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Science as well as the Department of Biology, Aerospace Engineering, Biomedical Engineering, and Dell Medical School at UT Austin. Shamarati's education and research interests include data science, machine learning, software development, mathematical modeling, uncertainty quantification, and applications of data science to astrophysics, bioinformatics, biomedicine, education, and transportation. And now, Amir will be giving us his talk. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So again, uh, thanks everyone for your time and for being here. Um, uh, as I said, uh, if you heard me, 
this is an ongoing work that I'm going to talk about um, at the moment. Uh, there is a still work to be done on this project, uh, but I'm going to just share some of the exciting insights uh, into this project uh, with you. So uh, to give you a brief background, uh, my lab has, actually does a lot of different things, but the common theme in all of these projects uh, is data and computation. So I have students who work uh, on astrophysical problems, to bioinformatics, to biomedical, as well as uh, projects on um, algorithms, machine learning techniques, and software development, as well as traffic engineering recently. So if you are a graduate student or an undergrad and interested in, um, in any of these topics as your career or as your graduate studies or research, contact me or visit my lab uh, at cdslab.org. And some people ask me, uh, as a physicist, uh, why do you do data science? What's the connection between data science and physics? Uh, and then some other people tell me, where is the physics in your work? Um, uh, it, this is all non-physics. And um, the answer that I have to both groups of questions uh, is just a history of uh, uh, physics. So if you look back at the history of physics and data science, you see that a lot of physicists have uh, uh, done major contributions to the foundations of data science. For example, um, the entire foundations of Bayesian probability theory, modern Bayesian probability theory, was laid out by uh, physicists, in particular Richard Cox and Edwin James, and before them, uh, Harold Jeffries and Laplace. Right? And at the same time, in modern times, particle physicists have been responsible for generating the largest. Uh, data sets in the world, um, uh, the big data that we all talk about. And at the same time, also, they have been responsible for generating tools uh, for communications and information processing and information sharing, such as the World Wide Web, which was for the first time established at CERN, particle acceleration. So, um, to give you um, a, a, a very quick introduction to this topic, uh, let's begin with this very simple question. How do we make a scientific inference? So here is a very elementary depiction of the scientific methodology. Uh, do you see my mouse, uh, the mouse moving around? I want to make sure that... Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Because uh, I'm going to use it over the um, slides soon. So um, here is a depiction of the... Uh, elementary depiction of the scientific method. On the left-hand side, we have the reality in which natural phenomena occur. This is the nature. And then on the right-hand side, we have mathematical abstraction. So we observe a set of natural phenomena. We collect the observations, do an inverse problem, which is basically forming a hypothesis, building the model, calibrating the model, validating it, and then doing a power problem, which is predicting some quantities of interest, and then comparing it again uh, with natural phenomena. Right. So for centuries, this has been the workhorse of scientific inference, or to put it more um, uh, elegantly, uh, the hierarchy of the hierarchy of uh, prediction is basically like this pyramid. At the bottom, you have the calibration scenario. On on the left hand side, you have your model. On the right hand side, you have your data. And then on the rear side, you have reality, which you never observe because it's always obfuscated with um, uncertainty and error. So you never observe the reality. All you observe is data. And now, uh, once you form a hypothesis, you calibrate your model by fitting the parameters, and then you validate at the second level. And then finally, um, uh, if the model is validated, you make a prediction of the quantity of interest. All right. So now, for centuries, this has been, again, uh, the, the workers of scientific inference. And there has been two pillars in science, uh, experiment and theory. But things have changed uh, over the past decade, over the past century, um, most. Uh, and if you look at um, the, the, the picture of science nowadays, you realize that in addition to theory and experiment, we have now also a third pillar, computational and data-driven models. Some people like to split this also into a fourth pillar and say computational and a fourth pillar data-driven. That's fine. Uh, th this is the way I've shown it here. Um, and most commonly, these computational and data-driven models um, serve three specific goals or purposes in scientific inference. They could be a workflow for predicting data, uh, hypothesis and prediction, and that's typically what's called predictive computing. Uh, they could be a substitute for experiment and observational data where 
observation data is not available. That's numerical simulation, quite familiar to physicists. And then a third category, which has become extremely popular within the past decade, uh, is a substitute for theory. Uh, so the, comp uh, the computational or the data driving model is a substitute for theory where it is not available. Uh, and that's called data driven discovery via machine learning, deep learning, and all the buzzwords that we hear nowadays. All right. So now, if you look at the uh, word re uh, relative word usage frequency of some of the key words in uh, scientific fields over the past century, you realize an interesting uh, trend. So on this plot, on the y-axis, you see the relative word usage frequency in the entire human corpus. So anything that has been written up by humans over the past century uh, versus the year of publication. And you see so the, the name of the scientific fields or engineering fields like mechanical, which responds to this line here at the top, and so on. So physics is the red line here. You see all of these traditional fields have remained uh, relatively constant in popularity over the entire century. Whereas some new fields have started to emerge within the past few decades, like biomedical, bioinformatics, proteomics, genomics, and neuroscience, cognitive science, neurobiology, geospatial sciences, geosciences, computational sciences, computational physics, all of these are gaining more and more popularity. And to just remind you, this is a semi-logarithmic plot, all right? So anything linear on this plot means exponential growth. So it's not only growing relative to other fields, so other fields may be also growing, but these fields are growing even more so than the other traditional fields, right? And then it's not even growing with respect to the other fields, its growth is exponential, right? So that's what these uh, linear uh, lines here basically mean, linear curves here mean, right? They, uh, the, the flattening here in the end is just because of lack of data in recent years. Uh, so it, it's not really something that's substantial. Right. Now, the interesting thing is that um, when you look at the whole of, um, set of these new fields, you see they all started at some um, time around mid-century, uh, mid-19th, uh, 20th century, basically, last uh, century. And the hallmark of all of them is ANIAC project. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but ANIAC project is basically the project that started the era of digital computers on Earth. And uh, on this plot, you see uh, the relative vortices of frequency of some of these keywords like computer optimization, simulations, Bayesian modeling, data mining, machine learning. You see all of these keywords and tools that we are now familiar with and use commonly did not exist just a few decades ago. But ever since then, they have started growing exponentially. Now, if you compare it with the previous plot that we had, there is a sort of a hidden connection here that you may have already noticed, that the growth of popularity of these fields seems to be tightly connected uh, with these tools and techniques that have been developed over the past decades. And what's unique about these tools is that all of them provide us information, and data, and that additional data, that flood of data has enabled the progress and the popularity of these new information-based fields like genomics, uh, biomedical, and so on, right? So because of these things, as a result of these rapid developments, a new field of science over the past uh, decade has emerged, which is called data science. And as a result of it, there has been a surge of skill requests and skill demands uh, for uh, for data science uh, jobs. So, for example, if you look at the uh, uh, some of the skill demands in the in the job market between 2013 and 2018, just five years, machine learning skills uh, demand grew uh, uh, grew by about um, 800 percent, so eight times more in just five years. Our programming language the same, data analysis um, uh, and all other tools, as well as data science roles. Um, the job titles like data scientists, uh, it, it grew by uh, more than 600%. So, right. so um, responding to these rapid changes, uh, we at UTA, the University of Texas at Arlington, um, uh, three years ago decided to create a data science program um, that would train students uh, 
in data science uh, tools and techniques and uh, basically anything that they need to succeed in a data science role. Uh, UTA, uh, to give you a brief background, is um, uh, located in the DFW Metroplex. It was established in 1895, more than 100 years ago. Um, the interesting thing about uh, the location of UTA is that it's uh, at the heart of a large metroplex with more than 8 million population. This metroplex is the third largest concentration of Fortune uh, 500. Um, it's also the largest economic engine of Texas. The UTA has about 40, more than 42,000 students. Um, and it's also the second largest institution within the University of Texas system in Texas. Uh, and it's also the fifth most diverse campus in the US according to 2018 uh, ranking. Um, and the data science program of UTA was established by the College of Science. Uh, so it's within the natural sciences uh, programs. And uh, right now it's only implemented as a major and uh, minor for undergraduates. Uh, and the final approval, we just received it in uh, a few weeks ago. And the formality is being done right now to finalize it. Uh, the College of Science itself is comprised of six departments. And here is a, a picture of all the faculty uh, in data science, uh, involved in data science activities. So one of the major challenges that we had uh, and we have it still with data science uh, of the College of Science uh, uh, is that the, the UTA data science program is unique in the nation for its focus on natural sciences and that creates problems for us. For example, uh, the data science codes of the, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board um, categorize data science topics into three major. Uh, uh, the other one is basically none, so if, uh, it's basically two really. Uh, so it's data science general which if you look at the uh, description of it, you see it's mostly large scale data resources and pretty much everything that you may see in a computer science curriculum, right? And then there's also data analytics, which is uh, computer science with more applications to say, but in no place you see any mention of natural sciences playing any role. Uh, despite the fact that many of these data science jobs are available for um, physics majors and um, biology majors, chemists, and all the other fields that exist in natural sciences, right? So this has created a challenge for us uh, and uh, has raised a couple of questions uh, that we need to answer. For example, what course curriculum is appropriate for a data science program from a natural science perspective? What should we do with the highly dynamic landscape of data science knowledge and skills, given the abundance of local uh, employment opportunities in the DFW Metroplex? Uh, are they training the students well for the, for the future jobs or not? So these are the questions that we want to answer and we have been trying to answer um, um, uh, because we need these uh, to prepare for the uh, curriculum development. So uh, to give you an example, uh, if you look at the history of plasma physics, uh, you see that the peak of plasma physics happened at around 1985 or so. Uh, then you see uh, also airspace here, down here, the green uh, curve. And also you see uh, one significant tool that helped um, the, uh, the, the progress of these two fields, aerospace and plasma physics program. And you see even the, the, the peaks of and the, the ups and downs of these curves seem to be highly correlated with each other, uh, although with a different scale, but they, they, they do seem to be correlated with each other. Now, this explains, this is an example of um, correlation between tools and uh, did and scientific scientific topics uh, that we may never know uh, if we were at that moment in time we would never know that the plasma physics is going to go down and then so fortune is going to decline in popularity with plasma physics right if you look at for example bioinformatics you see python and bioinformatics highly coupled to each other in some other tools like Perl, come and go and gradually decline right so uh, at this moment that we are right now in 2020, we may actually be right now in this highly dynamic landscape and in a few years, maybe Python would not exist anymore or uh, it would not be as popular as it is right now, who knows, right? So these are the kind of questions that we need to answer when we're de de defining the curriculum uh, for data science courses, right, and uh, programs. So uh, fortunately, there is a website a governmental website called the Occupational Information Network, ONET, 
It's a free online database containing occupational definitions and required skill sets. If you go there, for example, search for physicist, yeah, you're going to quickly find a list of uh, all physicist jobs and activities and descriptions, detailed descriptions of how to become a physicist and what skills and requirements you, uh, you, you need to have. For example, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you're going to see these are the hard skills that you need to know for, as a physicist um, and so on. But if you do the same uh, with data science or data scientist, uh, the closest match that you get is information research scientist, which is nothing at all like a data science, right? So even the best tools that exist right now do not provide us enough information about data science, right? So responding to these needs, uh, we formed a team at UTA uh, with Angela Dugal uh, as the PI from psychology. And uh, we had uh, two also from Justin Dellinger and uh, Lisa Berry from uh, Learning Analytics Lab at UTA and Minerva Cordero, um, a mathematician associate director of our uh, uh, college as well as my undergraduate, who has been um, re really helpful in collecting and analyzing the data, and myself. And uh, we had a couple of uh, objectives uh, in, our, in our project. Uh, first, uh, we wanted to perform a competency analysis, which is basically determining the specific technical and soft skill competencies in data science and evaluate whether these competencies vary among uh, domains of science knowledge. For example, biology, chemistry, uh, mathematics, physics, psychology, the major fields that we have in our uh, College of Science. And second objective, I apologize for the screen uh, disappearing frequently. Uh, all right, so uh, objective two is gap analysis. Uh, so we wanted to determine whether students enrolled in data science courses are prepared for positions in the workforce and identify the greatest disparities between education and employability. Right. And the third objective, uh, which is curricular recommendations, uh, we wanted to evaluate data science course competency maps as tools and guide um, course development and student learning paths and formulate uh, curricular recommendations based on the identified education employability gaps and learning theories. Right. So I'm going to only discuss the first objective, which is the competency analysis. And that's just really the beginning of it. But it should give us a good idea of uh, what we are trying to do. So uh, two major approaches exist um, to um, uh, competency analysis. And so, uh, in particular, expert opinion has been um, extensively discussed in this GDS series by a, uh, by a few other speakers. Um, basically, we asked uh, experts their opinions on the, uh, the, on the kind of skills and competencies that data science requires. Uh, but as a software developer, um, I tend to automate uh, anything that I can. And uh, that actually gives me the second approach, which is basically uh, setting up a pipeline to dynamically collect, analyze, and learn the competencies for data science. Um, and uh, we are actually taking both approaches, but the one that I'm gonna focus in the, the one that I'm uh, doing pretty much is the second one, right? So to do so, we um, started collecting jobs, uh, job descriptions, uh, over 30,000 job descriptions from a couple of um, websites, uh, uh, basically uh, job search engines like Career Builder, LinkedIn, Monster and Indeed, and uh, uh, each one of them, uh, we had more than a few thousand jobs collected. And the job titles are mostly binary mathematician, biologist, business analyst, chemist. Uh, we tried to um, uh, do our search in a way and collect the data in a way that covers most of the natural science fields, uh, as well as business, because a lot of data science activities also goes into business and wanted to know what is interesting there as well. And uh, here is a map of all the data, all the jobs that we parsed and collected. I forgot to mention that out of those uh, 30,000 jobs that we collected, only uh, about 23,000 of them were uh, unique among all the websites. So we had to refine and uh, clean up the whole data set, remove anything that, uh, that is not uh, useful, doesn't contain any useful information. That was a very challenging task for us because the structure of these descriptions are highly heterogeneous. So about 15% of the jobs comes from California, 
and then a high fraction from Texas and then the East Coast, um, the rest of the states are. But this doesn't give us a very good look. So if you zoom in and look at the counties, you see that there are uh, the, 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 the jobs are actually pretty much spread across the country with the exception of a few counties uh, that uh, stick out. So for example, uh, there is the Dallas County here, um, Dallas-Fort Worth area. This is the, um, uh, the Santa Fe, I believe. It's uh, where uh, the Sandia Lab and Los Alamos Labs exist. Um, this is Phoenix, Los Angeles, San Diego, and San Jose, Santa Clara, San Francisco, uh, the Bay Area, over there, and the mirror on the side. Now, uh, if you look at specific topics, uh, you see some interesting patterns. For example, if you look at biologists and bioinformatician or biodata jobs, all of a sudden, um, the focus and the concentration of jobs goes to the East Coast, in particular, the Boston area, right? And San Francisco always, all the time, uh, is uh, uh, highlighted in all the maps, if you look at it. For example, you don't see much activities in Dallas area. You still see some um, jobs there, but uh, a lot of it goes to Boston. And now, if you look at business, um, the, the, the map uh, flips, and most of the jobs go to Dallas and Los Angeles. And uh, you don't see much in San Francisco, for example or Boston on this side, and also in Miami, for example. And if you go to Chemist, then San Diego becomes a hub. If you go to data-related jobs, again, Dallas uh, pops out in uh, Los Angeles and San, and San Jose and San, um, uh, San Francisco. These are all, all data-related jobs. That includes data analysts, data scientists, uh, anything that deals with data. And uh, if you look at, for example, jobs that are specifically relevant to data in their title, like data analyst, data engineer, data scientist, these three, uh, you get pretty much the same thing again, Dallas and San Jose. And again, a data scientist, again, all of a sudden, you see, if you focus your searches to data scientists, all of a sudden, most of the jobs go to uh, San Francisco, the Bay Area, right? And for mathematicians, a similar pattern. I'm going to skip these quickly. Uh, one interesting observation was that uh, much of the physicists are actually hired in um, the New Mexico area. And that's mostly because of the national labs that exist in New Mexico, as well as a couple of them in the uh, Louisiana state. And I think most of it is because of the oil industry over there. And also, we see some activities also in Dallas, right? Then we also did a psychology job search as well. Um, I'm going to skip that again. And software, the same. So one interesting observation is that if you look at the data jobs, data uh, job titles, and uh, rank them based on uh, the degree requirements, see that data scientist uh, requires the highest skills and degree levels, whereas data analyst requires the list of skills, uh, and then in between there is data engineer. So that may not be surprising to uh, some of you. Um, I had seen this before, so it wasn't surprising in our data set for me. Um, but the interesting thing is that when you compare it with uh, physics or STEM major fields, like uh, physics and bioinformatics, you see a huge difference. So in data-related jobs, uh, a bachelor's or at most a master's seems to be appropriate and enough, uh, with the exception of data scientists. So data scientists typically tend to have a higher degree. Uh, but in physics and bioinformatics in particular, uh, doctorate is almost a must. So it's about 80% uh, of the jobs require a PhD or uh, prefer a PhD, right? And now- you have about five minutes. Sorry. Uh, what was that? You have about five, five minutes. minutes. Then we go to Q&A, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we are uh, close to the end. But the interesting thing is that, uh, so um, this actually can explain why we see uh, a flood of interest and uh, people going toward data science, because uh, with little um, uh, experience and expertise, they can gain salaries that are comparable to physicists or even far better than a bioinformatician with a PhD degree. So that actually can explain some of the uh, uh, interest and popularity of data science um, degrees in recent years. But um, what are the skills? I mean, what are the skills? What are the techniques that the data scientists need to learn? So 
uh, to explain that very quickly, um, within five minutes, I'm just going to tell you what um, uh, we have done so far. So uh, one problem with analyzing data um, uh, containing words uh, and categorical variables is that you cannot quantify them as numbers. There is uh, one popular way of quantifying words as numbers, and that's called one-hot encoding. So basically, um, you grab all the words, unique words that you have in your collection, and then you assign, uh, you create a vector uh, for each one of those words. And each element of it represents whether that word is present there or not. So for example, uh, for the row vector, uh, is gonna have one here because that represents row, but then for all other words, it's zero. Uh, similarly for Paris, um, there's only one. So this is called one-hot encoding. All right. Now, um, basically, what we want to achieve is that we want to translate uh, all of these words into vectors, right? And now there are different types of um, uh, translations that can be done, and those are called word embeddings. Uh, so the, these are the uh, couple of examples. I'm not going to go through them. I'm just going to tell you exactly what these mean. So if you look at the description of these uh, uh, one hot uh, vectors, you see that all of these words become perpendicular to each other because this is basically a basis for your space, all right? And these are all perpendicular. But the interesting thing is that many of these words may have underlying correlations with each other. And the purpose of semantic uh, uh, analysis is basically is to uh, extract this information from uh, your vocabulary. For example, to find out that all of these are capitals of a country and they are so related to each other. This is highly similar to the concept of principal component analysis, for example, right? So um, basically our goal is this, we have a orthogonal set of uh, vectors and we want to transfer them, tra transfer them somehow uh, into a semantic space where the vectors have relations now with each other. So the ones that are relevant to each other appear in a similar context, they appear together. So for example, the capitals of the countries appear together, the countries appear together. And now the relationship between these words um, can be applied from one set of words to another. So like the relationship between Paris and France is like the relationship between Rome and Italy. So if I subtract Italy uh, from Rome, it's gonna give me the same result as if I subtract France from Paris. And now, uh, interesting research has been done that shows that words represented this way have really interesting properties. For example, the relationship between king and queen is similar to the relationship between man and woman. So if you uh, subtract woman vector from a queen, that gives you the same vector that you would get from subtracting man from a king, right? So this is a very powerful representation. And now there is a special model called the skip gram model. Um, it's a simple neural network model. What it does is that it, is, it scans your text and then defines windows of neighborhood. And then any word that appear together in that window can have potentially relationships with each other. But those relationships will be discovered by the neural network. So for example, here, lazy doesn't have any connection with intelligence with this window of two. Uh, they never appear together, so they don't have any relationship with each other despite I believe that they actually connected to each other very much. Um, intelligent people, the lazy people are often also intelligent people. Um, so here's another example uh, with a window of um, two, so uh, with a window of uh, three and then four and so on. So uh, we create pairs of variables that are within this window and that just serves as our training sample, right? Now, this is a schematic. Uh, term of the neural network there. It's not really a deep learning, it's just a one hidden layer in between and the, the input and output layers. The input is basically the, 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 the all these data that we collect from the job descriptions. The output is the probability of co-occurrence of any of these words with the specific words on the output side. So let me show you some of the results that we got quickly. Um, so yeah, you for example, you may yeah, we are pretty much to, uh, at the end of the talk. So uh, you, have, you may have seen coding, statistics, and domain comprising data science. Now, what if you extract coding, uh, uh, keep coding aside from the statistics and domain knowledge, what do you get? You get analytics. And not surprisingly, our model is able to predict that if you uh, subtract programming from science, data science, you get analytics uh, keyword as the vector, as a resultant vector. Now, if you look at some of the keywords, for example, with programming, this enables us um, to, to parse the entire contents of uh, these job descriptions. 
and extract the kind of things that are relevant to a specific keyword interest. For example, with programming, it seems like Python is the most um, uh, popular scripting languages, MATLAB programming and so on. But now if you go to data science, uh, all of a sudden programming is not that important. There are other things like, for example, analytics, the statistics, quantitative, wrangling, uh, cleansing, visualization, all of these things become important. Um, if you go, for example, to data scientist uh, title, uh, again, pretty much the same thing, but you see also analytics and engineer, modeler, pipelines, developer. Um, if you go to data plus programming, uh, Python is a prominent tool, but you see also SQL, um, algorithms and scripting. And then if you go to bioinformatics plus programming, then um, a couple of other things stick out. So like uh, Python and MATLAB. And now I wanna, uh, as a last slide, I wanna compare it with physics. Uh, if you go to physics, all of a sudden the landscape changes. MATLAB and then Fortran and then Python are the dominant, and then the rest of things are basically a shallow landscape, right? So this gives us a very powerful tool to describe the kind of skills and tools that we need uh, uh, for data science curriculum. So with this conclusion, I'm going to leave, uh, 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 leave this presentation with any questions. Thank you very much for your time. I hope I finish in time. Yes, thank you. Um, the floor is open for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Amir. Yes, sure. You can type in questions in the little box that's labeled questions. Um, so I do have a question. What do you think are the, the reasons behind the differences in those plots you just showed really quickly over the last minute? Um, On this one? Uh, so, yes, that's a good question. So, um, again, this was just a few examples of what can be done with these uh, tools. For example, let, let me show you here. You see data science and data science, data plus programming, you get a very really shallow um, set of um, uh, keywords and tools that uh, co-occur with data and programming together, for example, Python. But the interesting thing is that you don't see much of a big difference between these tools. Like, for example, Python tools, statistical, SQL, they are all at the same level of uh, co-occurrence, right? Whereas when you go, and the same thing applies to uh, bioinformatics, but if you go to physics, all of a sudden, there is a prominent tool, MATLAB and Fortran and Python, uh, that have significant role in, uh, in data, set, uh, data science skills. So, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, physics skills. So that means if you have a physics student, uh, you probably wanna teach them MATLAB. Or if you have a data science student with a physics flavor, uh, you, you want to uh, focus a little bit more uh, on a tool like MATLAB for them. And we have one more question um, from yes. Amy Graves. Has any work been done on objective two, gap analysis in existing courses in your UT program or other typical programs? Uh, to, to do what? I'm sorry. Um, to collect data for, um, uh, for, for the curriculum, you said? I believe that's the question, yeah. Yes, uh, so that's a good question and that's essential and fundamental. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if this is a question from the UTA administration uh, because it's highly uh, technical. Um, it's not my responsibility in this project, but it's definitely something that we should do as a whole team uh, to collect this information. Ultimately, we would want to have all the um, uh, syllabi collected uh, from the existing courses and analyze them, including the courses within the data science program and analyze them, basically parse them with the same kind of model that I have shown you here and see what sort of uh, tools and skill sets they generate uh, given the same words, input words uh, to the model. And then we can make a meaningful comparison. See, for example, uh, for physics students, are we really putting emphasis on the, on the kind of techniques and the skills that they need upon graduation in the job market or not? Similarly for data science. Gotcha. And I know we're at time, but just one quick question. Um, uh, Ranu Bai asks, what does the analytics mean? And what kinds of specific work or categories under this? So, uh, so to me, analytics means uh, uh, statistics plus domain knowledge. And that's basically what the model told us, really. 
so if you look at this, the output of the model here, uh, you subtract programming, which is coding, from data science, and you get the keyword analytics, right? It's basically the ability to analyze data, uh, which is mostly a domain-specific data. So it's basically a combination of a statistics and knowledge. Uh, but again, it's highly opinionated, and the uh, border between these different fields are um, not very clear and um, not very sharp between data engineer, data analyst, data science. Uh, they are pretty much mixed to each other, mixed with each other. The, the particular difference is between data science and the other data related jobs. Data science typically means more senior level, and that's what actually the model showed. I didn't have the time to show it here, but frequently I see the term senior appearing with a data scientist title. That means you need years of experience to become a data scientist. And that's why they require a PhD for it, which our data shows again. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for your talk. We had some extra questions, but we are at time. So sure. now on to Mohammed Saltaniha. Um, where are we? Uh, Mohammed Saltaniha is a clinical assistant professor at the Information Systems Department at Boston University. Mohammed obtained his PhD in computational physics in 2015 from Northeastern University, where he studied low density, low dimensional, sorry, strongly correlated electronic systems. Upon graduation, he accepted a role as a data scientist at Infor. In 2018, Mohammed returned to academia and joined the faculty of Boston University to teach data science. Mohammed is also a faculty expert at Google Cloud. His current research interest revolves around computer vision applications in automating cancer diagnoses, as well as large scale computing and HPC. Mohammed has been an active member of the American Physical Society. He's been a founding member of the Boston Local Links in 2015 and the Forum on Early Career Scientists in 2016. He also served as on the Committee on Membership from 2015 to 2018. And in 2018, he founded the Group on Data Science and in 2019 became the founding chair of the Group on Data Science. So we'll turn it over to Mohammed. Thank you, Alexis. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, right, I can. Great. I can. All right, wonderful. Give me one moment. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amir. This is a, a nice segue after you discuss the after Amir discussed the tools that uh, and you know programming languages that are used in uh, data science uh, world and the job market. Uh, so we're gonna talk, dive in a little bit uh, deeper. Uh, this is a very high level talk. It's more educational and uh, tailored towards faculty who are uh, teaching uh, data science, um, you know, in their classrooms in different fields. The, the talk is uh, designed uh, domain agnostic. And, uh, but if you're not an educator, uh, you might still find it useful uh, if you want to use these tools within your projects or uh, within your research. Um, as Alexis mentioned, I am currently a faculty at the Information Systems Department at Boston University, and I'm also a faculty expert at uh, Google Cloud. By the way, the slides are available. Uh, I have a short link uh, down here if you are interested, uh, because I have some links uh, in the uh, later slides uh, for applying for grants for your classroom and things like that, uh, please go to bit.ly mm20-gds. Uh, and this is case sensitive. All right, moving on, a uh, quick disclaimer, uh, all of the content of the talk here is uh, my own uh, opinion and doesn't represent any of the institutions that I'm associated with. Uh, also, this is very important to mention because the entire talk is about tools and uh, 
most of these tools. Some are open source, some belong to uh, certain companies. Uh, I do not have any uh, financial affiliation with any companies that uh, the tools I'm, I'm using in this talk. Okay, so uh, data science tools. Hopefully your tools are not this rusty. Um, and there, this is a very, very wide domain and there are a lot of tools out there. I have tried to uh, include uh, as many as, as I can fit uh, within 30 minutes and uh, talk about them very briefly. Uh, a lot of them are uh, kind of industry standard at this point. Uh, and, and, and the, um, you know, obviously I'm leaving out a lot of the, the tools that might be still relevant. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts at the end of the talk, if you have any uh, further recommendations that I didn't cover here. Um, I would also like to mention that since, you know, this original talk was supposed to be in Denver uh, in March and it was uh, postponed to a online uh, series, uh, and you know, as someone that who is currently teaching for online classes, um, and this transition happened overnight, I thought this would be uh, useful to uh, talk about COVID-19 uh, and how uh, you know some of these tools could actually help the the transition uh, and facilitate the uh, experience of the students uh, in the classroom. So I will mention. Uh, you know, some of the advantages they have uh, in the current circumstances, but uh, in general, uh, these tools could be useful to uh, make our lives easier as educators, but also uh, people who are working within the project, they can be more efficient and, uh, uh, and basically take advantage of these tools. Some of them are absolutely crucial. Uh, if you are in the job market, uh, they, you know, if they, they add to the market, market value, uh, some of the, you know, Amir mentioned, uh, about the market value and uh, you know additional programming skills and analytics skills, it adds to the market value, and that's absolutely true. And uh, uh, we've been observing that in the market. All right, so uh, the first thing I wanted to start with is code sharing, because uh, if you're teaching a data science related course, uh, you have to give uh, code samples to the students. And what is the best format, in my opinion, uh, that you could use to distribute uh, the, the, the course material, uh, the, the uh, code example you want to give to the students, um, and the best practice for collaboration uh, within, when they're working within uh, assignments or team projects and, and, and so on. Um, I, have, uh, I find GitHub or Git in general, there are a lot of solutions out there, but particularly GitHub very useful uh, for my classes, all of my all of my uh, uh, course material are uh, public and available on GitHub and uh, my students clone uh, from it. And every week I update my course there. Uh, the, some of the advantages are uh, you can also, uh, you know, show them how to use GitHub uh, for their own uh, projects in a private repository. Uh, there are tools uh, besides just, you know, uh, code management and sharing also project management uh, tools, issue tracking, uh, wiki for documentation, uh, automatic uh, and you know automatic integration and uh, uh, documentation tools are all integrated in one place. Uh, if you're an educator, um, you uh, can apply for a free premium account. Um, and that is, that is at least true for most US universities and my experience is limited to the U.S. university. So if you are watching this from somewhere outside of the uh, U.S., that uh, unfortunately some of these tools might not apply, especially when it comes to uh, Google products. Um, so if you're interested, you can go there. Also, students can take advantage of the EDU uh, plan for, uh, for GitHub. Um, something recently I've learned, even with the free tier, you can have unlimited uh, private repositories, uh, which is great. Uh, the other advantage of using a, uh, GitHub is uh, its, its integration with Colab that I'll uh, talk about briefly. So the content delivery, uh, you know, one of the things I didn't open up the discussion here because of the limited time is the programming language that you want to uh, deliver the material uh, within data science. You know, there is a big battle between R versus Python, uh, or maybe I should say there was. So I'm all settled on Python and from the previous talk, you could also see its popularity. 
uh, that you know it's just increasing. At least for now, we don't know what the future will bring. There, there's a lot. Of, it's a very active space. But uh, you know, one of the best tools I find for uh, teaching in the data science area is Jupyter Notebook. Uh, it works with many programming languages, but particularly it was designed initially for Python. Uh, on top of that, uh, some of the uh, cloud providers such as Google or Amazon or Microsoft, they have taken the open source Jupyter uh, and they have adopted it to their uh, platform and they, are, uh, they modified it uh, and they offer different services. One of the most popular services out there is Google's uh, Colab Notebook that is becoming uh, pretty much the standard within the research community. Uh, you can uh, start a Colab Notebook like any Google Doc and you can work on it and you can run your notebook in the cloud uh, with the uh, compute resources, the hardware resources that Google is providing to you for free. Uh, there are free GPU and free TPU uh, options available. If you are interested, I have a very good uh, introduction to Cole Notebook uh, linked here uh, by one of the uh, former uh, GDS uh, speakers in the webinar series, Maxime. Uh, it's a great notebook, so I encourage you to click on that to get access to that notebook. Uh, Binder, I'm not going to talk about it uh, a lot because uh, if you're using Python, uh, it's really hard to beat Colab, but if you wanted to have a more flexible environment. Uh, Binder is also a free tool. Um, however, the, it's very, very limited in terms of compute. Uh, so the, the hardware that you would receive from Google within Colab context is much more powerful than Binder, but that's also an option that you can uh, consider. It will replicate your uh, public repository, GitHub repository, and uh, makes it interactive so people can run your code. Okay, so I've been talking about cloud. I mentioned it a few times. Uh, that's going to be the main uh, scope of my talk. I'm going to be talking about cloud computing quite a bit. And uh, most uh, particularly, I will talk about Google Cloud Platform. There are a lot of uh, cloud providers out there. Uh, and I, a couple of years ago, when I started to teach at BU, I had to make a decision where I would uh, want to, uh, to land. In my previous job, I gained a lot of experience working with AWS. So that was just uh, you know, natural for me to go towards that. However, uh, during my exploration, I realized Microsoft and Google have, uh, those were the other two I did my, uh, some research two years ago, uh, have a lot of machine learning uh, and AI related uh, services and tools available. Uh, so I started to focusing on those and uh, just because Google had still has uh, the most generous a funding opportunity for educators, I, I chose Google. And I, I'll be talking about Google specifically, but if you're using any of the other uh, cloud providers uh, that are listed here or some that are not, the concepts are very similar and uh, you can transfer the concepts from one uh, provider to the other. All right, so let's uh, first, you know, if, if you're not still convinced or if your students are not convinced why cloud, why cloud computing, uh, let's talk about that uh, very briefly, see why uh, it is very important to make this transition. Uh, one of the main reasons that is not mentioned here is that the businesses are uh, making the transition. So if you are going to the job market, um, the, the chances are your future company is uh, going to be needing um, to, you know, it's, it's going to be working on, on the cloud and you want to uh, know how it works. Uh, the advantages and the reasons companies have made this transition, researchers are making the transition, is uh, that it's on demand, uh, self-service, so you don't really need a lot of upfront cost uh, for it, but also anytime you need a service or anytime you need resources, uh, the hardware, it's available at your fingertips. Uh, it's accessible from anywhere, and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the sharing uh, makes it cheaper because uh, someone, the cloud provider, has to uh, make the investments uh, and set up the cloud. And uh, once that is all said, then you know the cost of uh, using it per hour is significantly lower than if you were to set up your own server. If you want to scale up uh, or scale back down, you can ha you have this rapid elasticity uh, for the cloud infrastructure that is not the same uh, if you had your own server. And uh, you basically pay for what you use and you can 
find it out uh, what your how much uh, cost you're going to have, and you can make predictions. All right, so uh, you know, an IT infrastructure is like a city infrastructure. Uh, the same way that uh, we have people, vehicles, and infrastructure uh, around in our cities, uh, this, the same idea applies to the cloud. You have the users, uh, think of users as you know, people, and you have applications. Applications could be uh, vehicles, for instance, going around, and you need the infrastructure that you know could be roads and such that uh, these vehicles uh, could use to move around. Uh, and a lot of it uh, could be actually outsourced to the cloud company, uh, so we don't need to worry about the infrastructure, for instance. We don't need to worry about the physical space where to put the computers, where to put the server, uh, the cooling system, uh, the electricity bill, uh, all of that, right? Upgrading the hardware. So it just makes more sense to have someone else to take care of the infrastructure. And even in some cases, uh, the applications. But for the most part, especially if you're doing research, you want to uh, focus on the, you know, you are the one who's creating the application. You are the user who's interacting with it. Uh, the uh, cloud progression, it basically started with first companies were thinking, all right, let's look at a co-location because uh, having it, renting a location just for your server is expensive and uh, they were sharing it at that location and each company had their own uh, servers there. Uh, and then it eventually changed to, to a system that, uh, you know, the, the, you wouldn't worry about not only the location, but also the hardware. So you would let the, uh, the cloud take care of the storage, uh, CPUs and memory and networking, and they would give you a virtualized experience and virtual machines and, and such. Uh, so you would just basically pay for whatever you need to use. And this requires the culture of, um, or in fact, I should say it's required because now most companies have already transitioned. You should have a lot of big people, big pool of people that uh, would be using it uh, so it's feasible. Otherwise, you don't want to have a lot of resources that are sitting there, no one is being, no one is using them. And also the serverless concept that uh, in some cases uh, very useful that you just, you know, you have a common task, for instance, translation, and you allow uh, the, the company, like a, such as Google, to take care of the translation, uh, translation for you. So you just provide your text, they translate it, give it back to you. Or having a company like uh, Amazon uh, to take care of uh, the you know, speech to text uh, with their Alexa technology, and they would give it back to you, uh, the, you know, the, your, your response. So that's serverless uh, idea. But let's talk about the infrastructure uh, just a little bit. I want to move on to the actual tools in a second, but uh, hopefully you're not too hungry. Uh, I'm going to talk about pizza as a service, and we'll talk about uh, you know different computing services in the cloud uh, after that. So the traditional uh, on-prem deployment solution that you had, it was similar to making your pizza in the house. You do everything from scratch. Uh, you uh, you have the kitchen, you pay for the gas, oven, uh, the dough, you choose a topping, and then you cook the pizza. Uh, now, uh, think about a service that maybe some uh, some chefs would provide uh, for uh, for lessons is, uh, you know, actually this is not the chef, this is just a kitchen. Let's say you go to an Airbnb, uh, the, the kitchen is provided, and the gas and oven provided, and you want to make pizza, so you bring your own dough, uh, the toppings, and then cook your pizza. Uh, so that is similar to infrastructure as a service. That the Airbnb host has provided all of the uh, tools that you need for cooking, and then you just bake your pizza. Um, and platform as a service is similar to the uh, chef example that I was going at. Uh, that the not only kitchen gas oven provided, but also the dough is provided. So you just choose the topping, and uh, and you, you know you cook the pizza yourself. Software as a service. However, it's uh, like you know pizza as a service. You you just uh, uh, get a food delivery, right? Pizza delivery. Uh, this concept translates uh, to the cloud. Uh, so infrastructure as a service is when the CPU, memory, storage, networking, all of that is provided to you. Uh, so you just uh, need to manage the operating system and application. Platform as a service, the op the platform is managed for you. So you just need to take care of the application. And software as a service or SaaS. Uh, you uh, even the software is provided similar to let's say Google Translate. Uh, you just provide the data. You just provide uh, you, the text that you want it to be trans translated to another language, and it gets uh, the tra translated. All right. So Google Cloud Platform or GCP. 
uh, offers several compute services. Uh, I'll touch some of these uh, later in the talk, Compute Engine and Kubernetes, but there are more. Uh, when it comes to storage, uh, the same thing. There are different needs, there are different uh, ways of storage and, uh, uh, the, and the services are, I'll touch on a couple of them also. Uh, big data, you would have, uh, you know, the uh, cloud data proc, that's the, that's the main one I'll talk about briefly, uh, BigQuery, and the same thing for machine learning, which is the area I think Google is ahead of the competitors uh, is this machine learning area, just because of the uh, you know amount of data that they've had and they've trained this uh, for uh, for the past couple of decades, these models, and uh, now they're making the models freely, not, not really, nothing is free on the cloud. They're making the models available for, uh, for instance, for, uh, you know, uh, translate or, uh, you know, for cloud vision API that you can provide your image and they would uh, tell you what is in the image. And you can also uh, build your own model, uh, bring your own data, build your own model. They just provide the, the platform. So we'll talk about that. Uh, for me, another very uh, appealing factor to uh, use Google versus other competitors was the way the projects are structured. First of all, you can think about the physical organization of your project. Uh, you would have a, uh, this, this on this side is a physical organization. So you, you would have to decide each of the computers you are using, where are they physically located? Uh, and this is important because of the data uh, uh, privacy policies that, uh, for instance, European Union doesn't allow any of the uh, customer data to leave Europe. So you want to have your data located there uh, physically and all of your other resources you want to keep in the same region. But also at the same time, you can have this logical organization, which is your project. So you can separate your projects from each other. At any given time, I'm involved in at least six or seven projects, either classes I'm working on or research, and I can completely isolate them from each other. They access, compute access, everything is fully isolated and the billing is completely separate. So those are the uh, areas that I have personally really enjoyed uh, using and uh, some of these other cloud providers that I have had experience with, they do not uh, cover. Virtual machines, um, so this is the compute, this is the infrastructure-centric solution that uh, you can basically rent a Windows or a Linux machine, uh, and there's no up upfront costs uh, required. You just pay per number of seconds, basically, that you're using them. Uh, and you can run any application that you can think of uh, with these virtual machines. Uh, they're highly, highly scalable, so you can set the exact number of CPUs and memory that you need. Uh, I believe you can go up to 160 virtual CPU cores and up to uh, almost four terabytes of memory with just one machine. You can have thousands of these machines. Uh, of course, they are expensive and it goes, you know, you get very expensive machines, but you can use them for a couple of hours, run your code and then shut them down and you just pay for those couple of hours, uh, which would be really cheap uh, considering that the fact that you didn't have to make any investments, you just paid maybe 20 bucks for a machine that has four terabytes of memory. Okay, storage. Um, there is all sorts of data available to us. And, uh, you know, most of the data is unstructured, uh, which I have, you know, the list of some of the unstructured data uh, that we are all familiar with here. And then about 20% of the data is structured and that's the easiest uh, one to work with. Um, and there are different solutions for uh, handling the structured versus unstructured data. So this is a very nice chart uh, from Google that, you know, there are different services, which one do I use for my storage solutions? I'm gonna point out two solutions here. Within the data science space, you would only need these two solutions. Uh, the first one, the first question is, is the data structured? If the answer is no, you want to use uh, cloud storage. This is like your uh, highly scalable Dropbox, you can put, uh, you know, petabytes of data here uh, from, from bytes to petabytes, and it's highly scalable. You just pay for whatever you put there. If your data is structured, and if your workload is analytics, and if you do not need a low latency, for instance, you, it's not connected to an application that you need immediate answer, then the answer is BigQuery. Uh, it's also highly scalable. You can have, uh, you know, billions and billions and billions of rows there. Uh, and again, remember, this is a structured data. Uh, and analyze it within a few seconds, and uh, Google will do the scaling for you. All right, so these are the two tools I wanted to mention. Uh, and moving to the 
uh, big data tools. So there are also a very competitive space. There are a lot of uh, tools out there. Uh, the, the main tool that revolutionized this space was Hadoop. Uh, originally, the original paper was published by, paper, uh, by, by Google, uh, Google File System in 2004, I believe. Uh, and then a year later, Hadoop File System 2005, it became um, you know, a open source software. Uh, there's you know, a lot of Hadoop family uh, tools uh, are listed here. But today, in 2020, uh, the analytics tool that you might want to use for either processing or uh, machine learning is Spark. Uh, has a lot of Spark has a lot of advantages over uh, over uh, you, you know your original uh, Hadoop uh, MapReduce, which is not even listed just because that, that's uh, that's a very old solution. But that was the original one. Hadoop file system was for storage of big data. And then uh, MapReduce was for processing. Uh, now, uh, today, we can actually, for storage, we can use one of the cloud solutions, for instance, Amazon's S3 or Google uh, storage uh, solution that I just mentioned earlier. And for processing, we can use Apache Spark uh, because it allows parallel uh, data processing uh, in memory. And that's, uh, that's very, very fast compared to a lot of the other solutions that we had before. Uh, it's available in Python. You can use a PySpark, the package called PySpark to access it, but also Java, Scala, and R. Uh, especially Java and Scala are the primary languages that the packages will come out, uh, and then Python. And a few months later, usually, our packages will be released. Um, I use Spark in my Big Data Analytics course, uh, and that's basically, this is just a you know basic architecture that you have the cluster manager. Uh, and uh, the cluster manager would uh, distribute, you know, would work with the driver process, which distributes the task uh, to the executors. Um, and you basically, Spark abstracts all of that away from you. You might be dealing with terabytes of data uh, and thousands of computers and uh, the nodes and uh, Spark would basically distribute your, uh, all of your resources. Okay, so I'm gonna be moving uh, away from here, but the, the tool, if you wanted to use Google Cloud for it, is uh, Cloud Data Proc that would, is going to make this uh, transition very, very easy for you. Uh, if you have old code that was uh, implemented for your on-prem service, all you have to do is about three minutes, using sorry. HDFS. Thank you. My timer is five. I think we started a couple minutes late, but I'm going to rush. Um, so Hadoop file system, you just have to change it to GS, which is for uh, Google Cloud Storage. High performance computing, uh, Kubernetes is the standard tool. Uh, it's an open source uh, container management platform. Uh, originally started by Google, now it's open source. Many people are contributing to it. Um, and if you're familiar with Docker, this is just a container that you can have any application running in Docker. It could be run on any environment. It could be your laptop, could be a cluster and uh, Kubernetes would manage that. Uh, machine learning, uh, I just chose four major players here for, for machine learning tools. Scikit-learn, so machine learning in Python, if you want to do machine learning at scale, Spark MLlib, uh, I would recommend, uh, and TensorFlow, obviously any modern machine learning algorithm is being trained on TensorFlow, and especially TensorFlow 2.0 has uh, gotten a lot better in terms of the, the data processing, and uh, especially having Keras on, on the top layer, uh, the barrier of entry is very low. Um, there are tools. Uh, I already mentioned that you know some of the pre-trained models that you can use at like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, or you could also create your own uh, machine learning algorithms and you just you know take advantage of the hardware uh, that is provided to you. There's also intermediary tools such as uh, Cloud AutoML within GCP uh, that you provide your data. Uh, let's say you have thousands of data points and we allow uh, the service to train a model based on your data. They use transfer learning for this and, and then you can reuse that model. Typically very expensive uh, and doesn't have a lot of value, but if uh, you just want to do a quick proof of concept project, uh, they could be useful. All right, I'm gonna uh, move away from uh, the, the Keras because I have, according to my timer, three minutes, uh, but I'm, Maybe I uh, finished a little bit earlier. Uh, so educational grants for cloud computing. 
I have a few links uh, here for you where you can also look them up online. Uh, Google Cloud gives $50 per student per course, and that's what I've been using. And the system, the ap application system is very straightforward. You can also apply for research grants. Uh, they give you know, 5,000 and above. This is for faculty and researchers, uh, certain universities. So please go to this link and uh, you know, just check if uh, your institution is, uh, is included. Um, AWS Educate has also certain uh, uh, programs from $35 to $100 per student. They're one-time, as far as I understand, uh, one-time credit. So uh, if the student is taking more than one course, then they might not be able to apply again. Similar thing with Azure, Microsoft Azure, it's also $100. Uh, it's also a one-time uh, thing. But the, there are a lot of resources available out there. The $50 goes a long way uh, if you, uh, direct the students to follow the good practices such as setting budgets and, and things like that. Auto grading tools, NB Grader, if you're using Python, it's a great tool. I also had a, I have a link here, how to integrate NB Grader with Colab, uh, which was developed by a community member, community member. And this is my final slide. I just wanted to uh, touch on a few, uh, a few tools that uh, could be particularly useful for the current remote uh, teaching uh, scenario. Uh, due to COVID-19. Um, Google Slides, I've, I found it really helpful, especially the little captioning part. Uh, a lot of my students uh, appreciate it, and uh, I think this, uh, this, this would be a helpful tool, even that we are teaching all of our courses online, um, the, along other functionalities. Slack channel is great for asynchronous participation, forum discussions, and it also will reduce the number of emails because you might be overwhelmed. Like uh, most of us that, you know, I'm currently, uh, I have over hundred students and I don't want to receive, you know, tens of emails every day. Uh, but the, with the Slack is a lot uh, easier to manage and you can set your notifications and get back to the students in a, even more timelier. Zoom, I just wanted to mention a few things. I know many of the universities are using Zoom, I thought to share a couple of my findings that have been useful. Breakout rooms, extremely popular. You can set the students to a smaller breakout rooms so they can discuss uh, the, the topic and work on exercises together, like teams of five, rather than having the whole class of 30, 40 students in one. Uh, you can do polls, you can uh, screen share, obviously whiteboard. Uh, if you have a tablet that works really nicely, chat box, raise hand. Uh, uh, setting up passwords uh, is, highly recommended these days, especially with the, you know, all of the news that you've heard. And I have some colleagues that have to deal with, had to deal with, um, you know, internet intruders. So take that seriously. Uh, and lastly, uh, but not least, Calendly is a tool that I recently discovered uh, that allows you, allows the students to um, secure office hours slots with you. Uh, and it has a free edu option, at least for the next few months, and as long as we are in this uh, situation. All right, so uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for uh, your time and opening up to the discussions. If you wanted to use any of these slides, I, the last slide is a disclaimer. Please read this before, as long as it's for educational only, that's uh, totally okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mohammed. And so we already have some questions and feel free to type in some more questions if you have them as they come up. Uh, so the first question is, a little off top from Steve Spurgeon is how, what software are you using to transcribe while you talk? They think it's really awesome. So this is, yeah, absolutely. This is the uh, Google Slide feature that I just mentioned. Uh, if you are using Google Slide, uh, you can uh, just, I don't know if you can see this option on my screen right now that I'm hovering over, but there's a caption section that you can turn it on and uh, it would basically live, cap live caption it for you. And the next question is from Dmitri, Dmitri Borikov, and he wants, you know, what are the specialties and levels of your typical students? Oh, a great question. So uh, I teach at the business school and uh, some of my students come with some uh, uh, programming background. Some of them uh, are part-time. They already are working uh, with data in their current job. Uh, so some are, coming with good experience, but some don't. So a lot of times uh, I start from scratch. I start with 
uh, basics of uh, programming, uh, basics of analytics, uh, good practices of visualization, exploratory phase uh, of a data uh, science project, uh, basics of machine learning. So uh, I, I, I have uh, different, and also the courses, like the big data course that I teach, uh, the students definitely are much more advanced when they come to that class. So they have uh, that kind of experience prior uh, to my class. I hope that makes sense. And then I have a question. Um, what are you hoping your students Absolutely. will get out of using all these different tools and things like that? Great question. Um, so for a lot of times, uh, I, I've heard this question from my students that they don't see a lot of value if they're using a data set that let's say it has 7,000 rows. Uh, they, you know, it just, it doesn't seem very practical to uh, transition to cloud and do it all there. Of course not, you know, you can, you can use your own laptop for that. But in reality, in, in real life, uh, you're, you're dealing with the data that is highly, um, uh, highly private and uh, it has to be kept secure in, a, in an environment that is, uh, you know, let's say HIPAA compliance, for instance, it has to be in the cloud or some financial data. You cannot bring it to your own laptop. You cannot even download it to your own laptop. Uh, or you're working with a lot of data that your laptop is not able to handle. Uh, so what do you do in those scenarios? Uh, or you have to wait for hours and hours and hours. On the other hand, a lot of the services that uh, are being offered, they save a lot of time. Instead of you, know, you going and uh, spending weeks or months building a tool, you can use a tool that is already available. It's been uh, you know, tens of engineers have been working on it for the past few years. The tool is already available. You use it, solve your problem, and move on. Uh, so there are a lot of advantages that could come from uh, transitioning to cloud, depending on which angle you're coming at. In terms of research, a lot of times, uh, you know, especially in physics, I've seen problems that people use, for instance, Kubernetes, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, nodes, computer nodes, uh, they use to solve a very big, uh, very big data uh, problem. And uh, something, you know, obviously you could use your university server, sure, but the university server is not gonna uh, have that kind of capacity to give you for maybe half a day. Uh, but in, in the cloud, you, you, can, you can do something like that. Uh, so it, uh, provides a lot of opportunities. And I think we're at time basically, and I want to be mindful of that. So thank you so much, Mohammed and Amir, if he's still here. Um, these slides will be, all these talk, the recording will be posted sometime in the near future, correct? Yes, absolutely. Within the next two days, you will get an email. Uh, with the recording of the talk, as well as the slides already, if uh, anyone is interested in, in my slides, they would be uh, accessible uh, through this link, uh, bit.ly mm20-gds. And I mean, uh, feel free to post your slides. Uh, sure. uh, we can communicate that later and we can uh, send the link to, uh, to the, sure. the attendees. Thank yeah. You. So thank you so much. And you all are doing April meeting sessions, right? The group on GDS. Yes, absolutely. So you should stay tuned for those. Yes, yes we'll please everybody. stay tuned uh, for April meeting as well as uh, the future webinars that uh, the topical group of data science will do. Yeah. Well, thank you. Right. And hope everyone thank has you. a good weekend and evening. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, Alexis. Thanks, Amir. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for tuning in. Bye-bye.